Indians of this land and pay my respects to elders both past and present. Thanks for coming. Um, this event is part of the Visiting Entrepreneur Program, a series of free events produced by City of Sydney with partner organisations from the local startup ecosystem. The 2022 edition of the Visiting Entrepreneur Program is kindly supported by Tech Central and the Greater Cities Commission. I also wanted to say thank you to Mark uh, from the Powerhouse for organising the venue tonight. Thanks very much to the Powerhouse for having us. Um, I'm told that this is the most popular session in the VEP uh, program. So hey. thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to get into the conversation, so I'm just going to sit down and we'll, we can get cracking. Um, we're going to have a little bit more of a town hall kind of conversation. So um, what I'd like to do is just invite you to have a... If you've got a comment to make or if you want to ask a question as we're going, uh, Tom from Grumps, uh, up in the top right-hand corner behind, well, okay. your left. Uh, this is Tom and Dave uh, in the puffer vest on the left, um, also from Grumps. Um, they're here to help with the conversation. So just chuck your hand up. Um, we've looked at the guest list. Uh, you all know what you're talking about. So uh, it, it's really uh, strange, uh, I don't know. Being, being the people that <laughs> have something to say, because a lot of you have a lot to say as well. So please uh, contribute if you've got questions as we go. Um, yeah, uh, I guess the first thing to say um, before I introduce my guests um, um, is to actually just frame the, the conversation and, and what we want to get out of it. Um, and the reason why Grumps uh, uh, set up this, this program in the first place, you'll notice uh, there's an empty seat um, for the visiting entrepreneur, um, <laughs> who's not actually a, a visitor, but is kind of a visitor, Zara Nalbandian uh, from Animal Logic, um, who uh, we had a pre-briefing with him two days ago, and in the consequential time, he has uh, come down with um, whatever you choose, choose your poison, because there's <laughs> a lot going around at the moment. So we don't know what it is, um, I'm not sure we'll ever find out, but he's out, um, which is um, upsetting. I think we almost lost Dorothy, so we're very yeah. lucky to have her, um, uh, but that's the nature of uh, events in this kind of climate. Um, so in terms of framing the, the conversation, what we want to get out of it is we want to get some concrete recommendations, and, and when I sort of, I guess, get into a bit more of an intro around the speakers and, and why we want to um, um, have this conversation is because... Ultimately, the things that we learn, we want to actually package up and put into some form of white paper um, and, uh, and use our networks to lobby on behalf of the industry. It's, it's, a, it's an emerging industry. There's a lot of things that need to change in order for us to, to get the work out there. So yeah, being here tonight is actually your contribution to it. So um, if there's anything that comes out of the conversation afterwards that you want to get in touch with us, just email us at Grumps and, and we can add it into the, the beast that will be. Uh, it might take us some time to get and collate that information, but ultimately we've, we've all got good connections into government in various parts of, uh, of Australia, but also into, I guess, the commercial sector. So that we want to present this forward as, as th these are real recommendations, so concrete recommendations. So that's what we're, we're going to focus our time today. Um, Obviously, you've read the, the agenda, so I won't go through... Oh, not the agenda, but the, um, the, the introduction, so we won't go through that. But um, we're going to look at some... You know, uh, up above, you've got some sort of... some Australian work, you've got some global work. Um, it'll be flowing all the way through. Um, Pete and Dorothy and myself might reference some of it at some point. Um, bathroom's just outside if you need it. Hope you had a drink. Housekeeping done. Um, we've got... Yeah, so essentially we just want to affect change and actually make more of the stuff that we love to go to and, and, and to see and, and to create. So that's done. All right. So I, I'm really lucky to, to be here today and, and to be presenting with these two fabulous people who I'm lucky enough to call friends. Um, and, and first of all, Dorothy, um, uh, named the, one of the five most influential women to watch in 2022 and the 10 most influential women leaders of 2021. Dorothy is one of the world's foremost voices in the global phenomenon of immersive and interactive art curation, and she's flown up specifically from Adelaide to be a part of this conversation, so really grateful to have you here. 
As the creator and founder of Molten Immersive Art, uh, she leads a collective of international experiential artists and researchers. Together they work at cut the cutting edge of new technology as art and art as creators, cultural strategists and digital immersive experience designers. Uh, she's also recently just been, it's just been announced three months ago, I think, that you are the, uh, have been appointed as the curator of the Noor Riyadh Art and Light Festival in 2022 over in Saudi Arabia. So, uh, quite, quite the coup. Um, um. Thank you. Next is Pete. <laughs> How do I follow that? Oh, I know, it's very hard, mate. Yeah. Um, uh, Pete's the co-founder of Remix Summits. You would have been to Remix, uh, uh, I, I imagine, if you are in this room, um, uh, which explores big ideas shaping the future of the creative industry's locations, uh, including London, New York, Istanbul, Dubai, and Sydney with different partners. Uh, like Guardian, Google and Vice. He's collaborated with the Australian Centre for the Moving Image uh, to develop Acme X, um, which you may have visited at some point, or you know somebody that works down there, and also the State Library of Victoria on Start Space. Uh, he's also the co-founder of Culture Label, or was the co-founder of Culture Label, uh, a venture capital funded pioneer in art online sales, which Sounds old now, but at the time it's was a revelation. I um, need to do something else, don't <laughs> I? <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, and, and he's a big champion of, of cultural entrepreneurship and creative entrepreneurship. And, uh, yeah, I'm James. I'm the CEO and founder of Grumps. Um, I'm also fulfill an executive uh, creative director function when I get the time, which is what I really love to do. Um, we're a leading Australian creative experience design studio based out of here in Sydney and also down in Melbourne. We're specialists in adventurous projects uh, and ambitious creative experience projects for organisations, cultural institutions, architects, businesses and brands that are looking to enhance lives and do some good in the world. I come from a creative background myself, not a, not a business background. That's something that I've had to adopt. Um, I started my career in film, dabbled in advertising. Don't hold it against me. Um, I, did, uh, uh, I was embedded in the Google's Creative Lab for quite a few years, ran a tech startup which Ask me about over a beer, it's a good story. And then uh, I'm also on the 24-hour advisory group, now the recovery advisory group for the New South Wales government, a uh, member of DNAD, Design Institute, AGDA, SEGD, and the Nighttime Industries Association. So I'm really active uh, in the community in terms of what we do. Um, all right, that's the intro. Thanks for coming. All right, Thanks, we guys. can get into it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we really struck a nerve with this... Um, with this conversation, and, and not only the conversation online, but also <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think just the fact that we've got so many people in the room. So, you know, um, after three years of, of not being able to immerse yourselves, you're immersing yourselves just with other people. So that's, we've made an experience in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so let's get it going. Um, first, I just want to talk about the numbers. So just, just bear with me while I, I, I run through some of this stuff, because it's quite staggering, right? Um, the size of the immersive experience market globally, um, there was $132 billion spent annually on entertainment and leisure in Australia, so this falls under that, um, uh, in 2017. So it, it, it's a big, big, uh, it's part of a big, big industry, right? Uh, $8.2 trillion is the predicted global experience economy by 2028. 10.3% of global GDP is dedicated to travel and tourism, which this falls under. And in 2018, there were 2 billion experience-related searches in Australia alone. So it's some pretty big numbers to get your head around. Like, there's a, there's a lot of opportunity from a financial perspective, and we're going to be talking about the creative perspective as well. But, uh, you know, what I want this conversation to be around is the structural reform that needs to happen in order for us to make these works um, uh, see the light of day here in Australia. So then... <laughs> Well, let's throw a question in first, because you guys have been sitting here a while and I've been doing a lot of talking. Um, what is the immersive industry and what does it entail, I guess, is, is my first question. I'm going to hand over to oh, LinkedIn's okay. top voice over <laughs> yeah. there. Because the first thing I say, if anybody wants to follow the global immersive industry trends, you can take nothing else than this, just follow Dorothy mm. on LinkedIn. Absolutely. It's a daily delight of everything <laughs> that's going on around the world, you know. I love that hashtag daily delight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, the immersive industry. Um, so it's obviously quite broad, right? So when we're talking about immersive industries, we're thinking about um, there's theme parks, there's VR, um, augmented reality, then there's the immersive experience, there's theatre. So it's quite broad, right? But I guess the elements that I think about 
when, you know, when I'm thinking, well, what is an immersive experience? It's something that transports people, right? So it's something that takes them out of their daily life for like half an hour. They have that childlike um, experience. They have those moments of discovery. Um, and, they, and they're kind of transported, right? Um, and, and those are the qualities, right? And, and I guess the elements that make that um, a unique and exciting experience is, is a combination of things. So for me, it's around developing an, a narrative. Um, and when I'm talking about narrative, I don't mean something that is uniform, something that we all experience in exactly the same way. It's something that, um, you know, everyone takes away something different from it, right? Um, and the other elements are, you know, obviously, you know, visuals and, and audio and, and all of that. Yeah, I, I would add to that as well. They've got these disparate parts of, you know, theme parks or, um, you know, immersive or virtual reality. But what's interesting is they're all absolutely colliding as yeah, well. Like completely. if you take a theme park like, um, you know, Disney a few years ago, they partnered up with, um, you know, Secret Cinema. Um, you know, so, you know, Empire Strikes Back, they, they created that, that world, that universe of, of, of the movie as a direct partnership between, you know, Disney and um, Secret Cinema. You can see with Galaxy's Edge, if you've been to kind of Disneyland recently, where they've literally recreated physically, you know, the world of Star Wars and dropping the visitors into it. Then they've got this incredible new hotel, which costs a standing, it's like two and a half thousand dollars per night or something like that, which shows you what people will pay for, you, you know, you, premium story-based experiences. You can't get a booking. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's so. impossible to get a booking. So. so there was money to be made out of immersive, clearly. Um, so you can you can see all of that sort of stuff's happening, which I think is kind of really interesting as well. And then, you know, on the entertainment side, like Netflix now have, you know, an experiences division and team, and again, are partnering with, you know, the likes of Secret Cinema and others. Yeah, so when I was looking at the, I guess, the global market, um, I, I, the, the challenge from an Australian perspective when you're trying to compare is that the, it's really hard to quantify. You can't, like, it, it's expansive as, as, as the, the, the crew has just alluded to, but it's also, we're not collecting any data on it, right? And, and I, one of the recommendations that's come out of the advisory group recently is you can't track what, well, we, you can't measure what you can't, uh, uh, I've got it around the wrong way. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it, right? So the first recommendation that, that we want to make is let's get some data around this. Let's understand what is going on in the community and what's happening so that we can actually start to, I guess, compare ourselves to what's happening overseas because there's some big numbers flying around. How much is defining this industry a problem, do you think? Well, what's, it, what's, it, what's happening with it? Is that a clear question? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I mean, you're right. I mean, for the first time, you know, through bodies like um, No Proscenium, who are worth kind of checking out, there's there's data and surveys at, at a global level. Uh, but certainly, I'd say, yeah, we're lacking data in, in places like um, Australia. The, I, I mean, there are numbers around around this stuff in terms of, you know, for the first time, there's a lot of, for example, kind of investment going into this space. So if we look at it, you know, globally, you know, the likes of, you know, Meow Wolf are raising, I think they raised like $158 million to kind of, you know, fund their, their mm -hmm. growth. So there's, there's kind of numbers out there. But I think um, the, the problem is we're not measuring it like other parts of, you know, I mean, getting down to kind of brass tacks. I mean, obviously, governments are interested in economic data and kind of job creation. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the overall size of that, you know, experience economy or immersive economy, there's, there's, there's clearly a case that these things are creating both sustainable and scalable creative enterprises mm. that are obviously funding artists, creative workers. Um, so there's an opportunity that if you, can, if you can make a case for that, then also you can make a case for kind of public investment. Because mm. if you look at around the world at some of the, the best examples in the immersive space, you know, some of them are pure private sector models, but a lot of them are kind of public-private models mm. and started with a little bit of public funding to kind of get them going. Mm. Um, um, but mostly they started actually as private sector enterprises because they weren't really recognized within, you know, the creative sector. So if you look at, you know, Punch Drunk, you know, one that many of us will know in this room, you know, they were a small London-based theatre company. Um, you know, they went to people like, you know, the Arts Council in the UK is the kind of government body for, for culture. But they got their big break because they managed to persuade a property developer um, that mm. if they gave them a building and invested a little bit of cash, um, that they would make this kind of development or this old raw mail sorting office 
into one of the coolest parts of, of London, and, and that would help them with their you know, future, future development. Mm. Um, what would be great, Ned, as we all know what a great story kind of Punch Drunk's been. It's been you know, one of the top shows, Sleep No More, in you know, New York now for over 10 years. It's got a great case for actually why mm. um, it should have had kind of public-private investment from, from the very beginning. Now that we know those things, wouldn't it be great in Australia if we can actually put together a case using the data to say that this is an industry worth investing in? You know, we've got the benefit of 10 years of hindsight, which is great. Yeah. But I think you, you've just travelled overseas. There, there's nowhere in the passport, um, or not the passport, but the uh, exiting visitors card, to actually put your, um, I guess, career in there that makes any sense from a from a tracking a, a data uh, tracking perspective. It's, it, it, I hadn't even noticed. Well, no, but it, it, it's like uh, yeah. you know, what what bucket do they put you in um, yeah. when you say what you do? Because they're, we're just not collecting any data on it. So I think it's a change, a systemic change that's causing a bit of issue. If we can just get some numbers around this, we can actually go to a property developer and, and pull together a project that actually says, well, we've got government funding that sits on the other side of this to the tune of X because this is an emerging industry and it's got a lot of weight. Um, yeah, I mean, Team Lab's another great example. Mm. So they teamed, they teamed, Team Lab teamed <laughs> with, um, with a property developer to yeah. set up um, Mori, which is in Tokyo. Uh, and they had 2.3 million visitors in their first year. Um, and what's interesting is half of those were from overseas and 50% of those travelled to Tokyo just to see Team Lab. So mm -hmm. you can just see the statistics are incredible. Now, Team Lab are, you know, I mean, they used to be 400, they're up to 700. Um, and, and what's interesting is like 70% 70, 70 of them are engineers. Mm. So it's a really interesting combination, but you can see the, the sheer scale and, and um, I guess, opportunity. Yeah. Doesn't they, it get they, more foot traffic than the Louvre? Is that, uh, it's, it's, the, yeah. the Guinness Book of World Records has said it's now the number one most visited museum in the world by a single artist or artist collective overtaking the, uh, the Van Gogh Museum. And yeah, interestingly, yeah. their most recent site that they've announced is in Holland, so they're going to be kind of directly competing head to head. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they, I think they're a great example. Look, they showed, as you said, you know, they've got artists, scientists, yes. technologists. So yes. that beautiful example of all of those different worlds coming together, you know. Um, any, any questions while we're at it? We'll just keep trucking. Cool. Um, so, Pete, you're curating Remix London at the moment. I think it's anyone who's in London in the next two months. I'm gonna make sure you're there for Remix. It's always a, um, a, a good show. Thanks for the plug. <laughs> no worries, mate. <laughs> it's always worse when it comes from you. So, um, <laughs> Uh, what's happening um, over there at the moment? Because you, you're curating it at the moment. You're seeing what's going on. I think you've got like 10 immersive experiences to go to. Yeah. Look, I, so this comes back to like how do you build an industry, I think. So and I'm not saying this is what we should necessarily do in, do in Australia, but it, it was fascinating, you know, you're sort of planning your trip over there and you're, you're planning the, the agenda for, for Remix. And I just did a quick count of stuff that I could go and see in, in London in a couple of months when the event happens. Um, and, I, and I guess it shows you, like, how do you create a kind of concentration of, of activity and players in, in your immersive scene? Um, and we think about, you know, we talk about what we do measure, to your point, we measure things like, you know, how many theatres or what the output might be of Broadway or the West End. So London has uh, over 250 theatres and... 39 of them are in the West End. And that's absolutely seen as part of like London's creative industries, you know, economic and you know, creative output. And it's something they measure and, and they really get behind. But I think, you know, and we, and we recognize, don't we, the value of that concentration of kind of theaters in one place and both the, the local creative output and the international creative output that's housed in those, those spaces. But actually, the same thing's starting to happen, I think, with immersive, but it's a little bit under the radar still. So when I did, you know, thought about speakers and what to see, so and I'll just quickly mention these because there's a few and I didn't want to miss any. So in London at the moment, you've got Secret Cinema, like Punch Drunk, one of the original kind of players in, in this space. They've currently got a show um, which is a, a, a production in partnership with kind of Marvel. They've just done their first foray into bringing alive uh, the world of video games. So they've, they've just done the kind of League of, of Legends. Obviously, massive audience there. That's the, uh, the bastion of kind of eSports. Um, they've also just done their first kind of online-only experiences working with the, um, the new Ghostbusters model. And if you don't know Secret Cinema, they, 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 they bring alive those kind of worlds of movies. 
You've got um, Immersive Everywhere. Now, they're a really interesting company because they've built a permanent immersive theatre space in London. And they've been running something um, called the Great Gatsby Immersive Experience for over 10 years now. It's the longest running show, immersive show in, in London. But they've just teamed up with the BBC and have, um, uh, it's just closing actually uh, last week. Uh, they've worked with the BBC on, on creating the first kind of Doctor Who immersive experience. Mm -hmm. And they've created 17 different worlds from the Doctor Who universe, if you're into that. Over 50 different um, actors working on that. <laughs> and they've just got the, um, the rights to create the first official Peaky Blinders live immersive experience, if there's any Peaky Blinders fans in the audience. Then, of course, you've got Punch Drunk. You know, they've come back to their roots. They've done, they're doing their first show in London for literally for, for years. Um, 100,000 square foot experience in... Um, mm the former home of the, uh, the Royal Navy, the Royal kind of Arsenal in, in Woolwich, which is now this huge kind of creative industries district. Um, and, and the reviews there are saying absolute cultural phenomenon. So if you're in London, go and see that. And then interestingly, you've got players like, the, I guess you would say the more conventional kind of cultural industry. So historic Royal Palaces, so they run things like the Tower of London and Hampton Court Palace. They've teamed up with another local immersive player, Layered Reality, who've created the Jeff Wayne's War of the World experience, which has been running for, for many years in London. But they've said, OK, you've got this amazing talent on your doorstep. They've teamed up, and they found this kind of hidden space next to the Tower of London that hasn't been open for about 20 years. And they're doing a kind of gunpowder plot, kind of Guy Fawkes um, immersive experience. So that's happening. Then you've probably read all about newspapers. You've got a permanent immersive venue where the ABBA Voyage experience is happening. So, so Industrial Light and Magic, who've got a studio in London, have created a really, I mean, this is, this is amazing what they're doing. So The Guardian gave it a five-star review, and they said, you know, we, and we know people have played with like holographic um, technology, but they were saying, you know, you would struggle to not know it's the 1970s version of ABBA out there on stage. That's and that's a permanent immersive space, 3,000 seats are in London's Olympic Park. Uh, you've got the War of the Worlds thing. You've got Frameless, which is a kind of, you know, sort of Van Gogh, you know, immersive projection space. You've got the Madison Square Garden Sphere. There's mm. one being built in Las Vegas at the moment. There's mm. a second one being built in London's Olympic Park. Again, a permanent immersive um, space. You've got Outernet, which is public space, meets, meets uh, immersive. And then you've got an offshoot of kind of Super Blue, which is a kind of sort of immersive sort of take on, on museums. Mm. So, you know, you can go and hear from all those people at Remix London, there's the plug. But, <laughs> but, but what was interesting was just the kind of concentration. But because you have those local players, you know, like your punch drunks, like your secret cinemas, what's happening is the other local cultural players, you know, like historic Royal Palaces are going, well, actually, why don't we start collaborating and partnering with these, um, you know, immersive players? And then we can think about telling stories in new ways, you know, around things like Guy Fawkes or whatever it might be. So I think the opportunity is there for you to sort of cross-fertilise different parts of the creative industries, mm. which is really exciting. You know, I think that's, that's a big opportunity here. Yeah, and, and there's some scale, really scaled examples. Um, I, I guess the question I have for you, Dorothy, is sort of creatively because they, they don't always sort of fit into, you know, outer net or, or these sort of other, um, I guess, um, uh, I guess more, more pop culture um, um, projects, right? A, a lot of the stuff that you're surfacing uh, at the moment are, are really kind of immersive artworks, almost standalones that might be in a super blue over in Miami um, mm -hmm. or they might be in the team lab um, um, I can't remember the name of the museum, but what are you seeing creatively around the world uh, uh, that, that has really blown you away in the last little while? Is there anything that sort of comes to mind? Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, where, where do you start? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, where do I start? So I was recently in Paris, um, and uh, there's a group called Culture Spaces. They have a they have many digital museums, um, and I was talking to Peter about it earlier and. What they've done is they've selected these incredible venues which are like a cross between, well, one's a foundry that's now been turned into a digital museum, so you can just imagine the beauty. And I think one of the images is actually up on the screen. But, a um, World War II submarine yeah, base. Yeah, World War II and, submarine yeah. base. So, you know, there's this whole idea of, you know, there's water, so the projection is actually projecting onto the water. And, um, you know, and what they're doing really well is it's all about quality. Like, so... Uh, the equipment that they're using is amazing. The stories that they're telling are incredible. Um, you know, the audio or the soundscape that's um, being tied to all of that um, is just beautiful. So you're actually feeling drawn 
throughout the experience. It, it feels like there's a story being told and you're taking on this journey. But also, you know, I guess versus a square room experience, um, you know, which there's, there's quite a few around, there's depth. In, in what they're setting up, right? So there's there's areas that you can kind of discover and um, so, yeah, absolutely beautiful, beautiful experience. But the idea of the visuals and the audio being connected is a key thing for me. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I'm seeing is starting to happen now. It's not just, oh, here's some visuals and here's some music mm -hmm. and we'll just slap that together. Mm -hmm. It's like there's really this, you know, the, the visuals are being created based on the on the, on the soundscape. And, and I guess that uh, technically, they're getting more complex, right? Like some of these things, they're, they're sort of, I guess, because there's more competition in the market, you were telling me last night, you know, sort of Meow Wolf's under pressure over in the US where they're just, you know, anyone who can is, is setting up in, a, um, in some of those, um, I guess, uh, redundant um, uh, uh, shopping malls that, that are no longer being used for, for, for shopping. Um, and, uh, oh, I think we'll have plenty of those here as well. In <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, and, and yeah. you do. You Space see, availability is a big part of this. <laughs> you, you, you see both ends of the market, but technically, um, I guess, to stay ahead of the curve, th there is a, a bit of a shift there as well, right? Like people are yeah, finding R&D is such a big part of, of, of what completely. these guys do. Completely. Yeah. And, and the audience are becoming savvy as well. Mm. You know, it's like when, um, when architectural projection first came out, we were all thrilled that we could see a lizard running up the side of a building, right? <laughs> and we're kind of over that now. Like, we, you know, we want, <laughs> we want there to be a story. We want to have some kind of connection to that. Um, and creating that connection is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess um, you've already kind of hit it, though, Pete, but, but commercially, around these business models, because we're, we're going to get into the, the, the nitty-gritty of this, like, are you seeing sort of... There's innovation on the technical side, but there's also um, a lot of these multi-party deals are being set up. Um, you know, it, it's a combination of placemakers, yeah. um, uh, big property developers. You've got um, uh, F and B. The, the, the combination of these things. I think I was put up a post about Area 15 the other day, which is this multi-party deal yes. um, where we're, we're sort of bringing people. <laughs> um, I, uh, I've got Mr. Hoyne in my eye right now, <laughs> knowing that you are an absolute expert in this space. Um, but it is a, um, yeah, what, what kind of commercial I, models are you seeing around this that are, are look, staggering? Yeah, look, interestingly, I, th I think immersive is both a story of, you know, incredible creative output, but it's also a story of creative entrepreneurship. Um, um, and, and I think it's, it's marrying the two together. And if you take something like, you know, Meow Wolf, I think, I think it's really interesting because, you know, they started in Santa Fe. That's a, that's a place of, you know, 70,000 odd people with no major airports. And if you can make, you know, a 500,000, you know, visitor attraction work in Santa Fe, you can pretty much make it work anywhere. Mm. Um, and obviously they, they, they found that kind of redundant space, an old um, bowling alley. They, look, they, they were lucky in that their celebrity resident in Santa Fe is George R.R. R. Martin, and they persuaded George to take it, you know, a long-term lease on the... Um, on the building and kind of invest in their product, but they, but they, they, they were, it was really scrappy. I mean, most of their art those days was built out of trash, as they'll, 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 they'll tell you. You know, it was, it was very kind of DIY, and, and you know, the, I think the overall cost, if you've ever watched a documentary, and um, when we brought Vince, the, the co-founder, over to Australia, was saying it was something like $7 million to, to, to build that attraction. It, you know, it really wasn't a huge amount of money in the, in the scheme of things of what they've created. But because they set it up as a, as a business, they've then been able to kind of leverage other forms of investment to kind of grow it. Um, you know, and Vince's vision was, you know, he thought Meow Wolf added something, you know, positive to, to the world and, and, and was a, a business worth kind of growing. But he was really clear that artists should be able to make money. And if Meow mm. Wolf made money, they would yeah. be able to support local mm. creatives. And if you look at, you know, we think we know the story of Meow Wolf, it's, it's the buzzword and immersive, but it's fascinating that even during the pandemic in the last kind of two or three years, like we brought him over three years ago, they had one venue in Santa Fe. Since then, they've opened up um, a venue in uh, Las Vegas, Omega Mart, as part of Area 15. That's done over a million visitors, you know, in its first year. They've opened a second 60,000 square foot venue in um, in, De in Denver, Convergence Station, and that's on track to do over a million visitors a year. And they've just announced like two new spaces in Texas. Interestingly, not in Austin, in like uh, in, <laughs> not in in Dallas and, and Houston. Um, and one of them's in an old 
uh, shopping centre mm. in a redundant sort of uh, department store. Um, so look, I think they're really interesting. But the, the other model I would just flag up really quickly is because they're, they're not a new story. Is, is I'd go back to Secret Cinema because they're fascinating. Because during the pandemic, clearly their business model was you know heavily affected. Mm. Like you know, lots of us that work in the, in the creative sector, um, so they couldn't do shows. So the, the UK government had a kind of loan scheme which was aimed at businesses that had the potential to do you know, exports because they, you know, they had to be sort of viable businesses that could grow, <laughs> but obviously had kind of challenging um, financial circumstances because of the pandemic. And it was available to loads of different types of businesses, but Secret Cinema kind of recognised that, hang on, we'll have a bit of that. So they took a loan, and that there was a loan kind of scheme, but then that loan was kind of later converted into equity, uh, equity. So it shows you can have kind of models if you've got the right kind of business structure that you can take that type of investment. But what they did, which was really clever, was, during the pandemic, they did a kind of um, drive-through version of their Stranger Things show that they did with Netflix. And that show, just before the pandemic, it had 100,000 people go to it. It was, it was absolutely incredible, where they kind of you know, brought alive that sort of universe of Stranger Things. And then they took it to the States, but they did it as a kind of drive-through version because of obviously all the issues to do with the pandemic. And they had like nearly 400,000 people went to the show. You know, during, so during, <coughs> just by going to the US, they'd kind of quadrupled their audience. And then they said, okay, well, how do, we, the fact, how do we kind of grow this business? And they did a really clever thing, which was like Secret Cinema's fans are like fanatical. Mm, um, mm. You know, they've got this huge following in person who, and also, um, you know, through social media. And as we know, a lot of these things are very visual. So they grow very quickly through, mm. you know, Instagram and, and other sort of social media mechanisms. So they said, look, if we're going to grow the business, why don't we go to our fans? And we all know kind of crowdfunding, that's not a new thing. But like crowd equity has really taken off in the U.S. In, the, in, in Europe in, in the last years. It's kind of now starting to happen in Australia as well. So they went out to their community and said, look, we've, we've gone from 100,000 people in London. Our first US show has got like 400,000 people. Like the US is kind of loving Secret Cinema. Can you help us grow the business? Because we need capital to kind of to grow and, uh, and to sustain ourselves. So they raised nearly 10 million Australian dollars mm. just by going out to their own fans yeah. and saying, buy a bit of the business. Go on a journey with us. So yeah. good. Yeah. And, and I guess... <coughs> I, uh, leveraging, leveraging your audience is is one common thread. Uh, partnerships is another common thread that comes through here. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, um, uh, uh, giving teams the opportunity to to engage in that R and D process is also another common thread. Are there any other kind of common threads before we move into the local economy and and what's happening here that we we can learn from overseas in terms of you know what's happening? Yeah, I guess well, there's there's always lots that we can learn, right? Mm. Um, I think um, I think I think the main issue is um, I think we just need to we need to be brave, right? We need to we need to want to want to lead, right? Mm. And we've we have all the skills mm. here in mm. Australia to be able to do it. Um, like as part of the curation program that are putting together for Noriad. It's got a huge component of Australian artists. Mm. Like we've got these insanely talented people here, um, and you know, um, and and I think we just need to, we just need to move forward and and lead. So it's not about bringing what's happening overseas here, right? Um, and I'm not against international work because otherwise I wouldn't have any work. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not about that. If we are going to bring international artists to Australia, we just need to make sure that it's culturally relevant, right? So it's not just importing something. It's you know we're going to make something that you know it, that speaks to our people, right? Um, but yeah, it it, it you, you know what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's a transaction, right? It goes. Yeah, exactly. it, goes it needs to go both ways, yeah, right? Exactly. It, it, we um, we. I guess the, there's the tall poppy mentality in Australia where we sort of, I guess, um, things are better if you get them from overseas. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, th I think that that's a, something that's shifting um, somewhat, or at least it feels like it's shifting in the water. Um, but in terms of those structures, I, I know you are based in Radelaide, and I know <laughs> most, of, but, but most of your work comes from overseas, right? Yeah, yeah so I probably do 1% in Australia at the mm. moment, and I'd like that to change, by the way. <laughs> but mm. it's just the way it's worked out. And um, I guess there's so much flexibility. Like if I look at Saudi Arabia as a great example, so they have a Vision 2030 plan, and, and it's basically to become the arts mecca of the world. Mm. And they're going to do it. 
So I've been working with them for about a year and a half now. I worked with the Ministry of Culture and during that time I developed um, all of their future events and festivals, like concepts for them, um, from a visual arts perspective. And they're just open. They're just, it, it's like, what can we do? How can we, you know, bring the best of the world here? How can we leverage our culture? Um, it, it's truly amazing. And and it's never about money for them, obviously. <laughs> you know, which is where I think there's a lot of hurdles here, right? Because the immersive industry is an expensive industry to set up, right? So when we're looking at Team Lab, um, like their venue is 10,000 square metres. I think there's 490 computers and about 510 projectors, right? That's a lot of money. Mm. But when you think about it, the inf once the infrastructure is in place, then all you need to do is change the content, maybe add some fabrication, and you've got a completely new experience. Mm -hmm. So the outlay at the beginning, <laughs> it seems extraordinary, but you know, but then it's it's like it's there forever. Yeah, and, and I guess it's the relationship between hardware and this 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 space, but also technicians, right? I, Zara, who's not here, but was you know, I hope he doesn't mind me parroting his words, um, but he was talking a lot about animal logic and, and w the reason we wanted to have this conversation with him is he's been instrumental in in, in growing an industry. Um, uh, the VFX industry when he first started here in Australia was, was next to nowhere, right? And, and animal logic has been a shining light um, all the way through um, and, and, you know, one of our greatest exporting companies from a creative perspective. But he was saying that, uh, you know, all of the technicians, all of the, um, uh, when we talk about a skills shortage, and we will get to skills shortage in a moment, but mm. um, it's not so much a skills shortage, it's a, it's a migration of skills from other industries that are absolutely getting, you know, pounded with work at the moment. All we need to do is just give them a different canvas um, mm. to, to paint on, right? So, and the same with hardware, right? Like a lot of this stuff is reprogrammable um, um, and, um, you know, it, it, it does get, redundant over time and you have to replace it. But once that infrastructure is set up, you can, you can go. Um, I guess my, my, my follow-up question is, is, rather than talking about Nor Riyadh, um, and obviously, you know, they've got all the money in the world and they can, they can yeah. do this stuff. <laughs> but why not Australia? What, 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 what are the uh, barriers uh, for you in terms of why you don't take on work in Australia at the moment so much? I know you do take on a little bit, but, yeah. Um, I think it's the, I think it's, understanding what, you know, how much money it takes to create one of these things. So the conversation starts off really positively. Mm. Let's, we want to create something completely epic and we want it to be the best in the world and then we've got $20,000. Yeah. And so it's like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I'm obviously exaggerating. Um, but there's are. also... <laughs> <laughs> but, there, but there's also lots of processes as yeah. well, right? So... Um, in Saudi, like, it, it is very much, if they like the idea, it's mm. almost like, can you make it bigger? Like, you know, can, you know oh, okay. And, which is completely the opposite to the way, you know, we're operating. I, I feel like we're playing so small. And I understand budgetary, like, constraints. I could completely understand that. But I think we need to invest in it. Mm. 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 Uh, I, uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on, on that? You know, w w a lot of you are working in the industry at the moment. So, you know, anyone? Anyone? <laughs> we can come okay. back at the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, if you can just say your name and where you're from as well. So just we, we... Uh, Like where I was born or where I work? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> whatever, whatever you want. How far back should I go? Where you work. Where you work. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Dylan Porter, I'm uh, from Burwood Council. Um, you, you mentioned before the Saudi government, they've, they've made that statement, we want to be this arts destination mm -hmm. globally. I think Singapore did the same a number of years ago. They saw mm -hmm. the economy shifting. We want to be a visitor destination. We had a budget handed down last week. I didn't really hear anything <laughs> about the arts, <laughs> entertainment, something about stamp, well, a lot about stamp duty savings, first time buyers, infrastructure. Uh, and even at a national level, we're not making statements about what we want to be as an arts or visitor destination. It, is that what's lacking? And we're not making those clear statements about what we want to be as a country or a city or a visitor destination. Completely. I don't think, I don't think we, um, I don't think we appreciate 
what what art is and you know what art can be and how important it is for starters um, as a culture like I think we need to put more emphasis emphasis on that um, it's you know it, its ability to bring communities together you know health and well-being like it, it, there's so many aspects to art um, and I think also like it generates a lot of money in this country um, and, and, you know, we're talking about, you know, music industry and it, there's so much that's going on here. And I think we just kind of, you know, we're, we're not talking about that. We're, we're busy talking about all this all this other stuff, which is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I, I would say, like, we, we, I think we are... We're kind of... We've started down the path, haven't we, which is, is the good thing. Like, I think knowing some of the people that are in, in the audience here, you know, look... Like Tam, for example, Tam runs, you know, underground cinema and immersive cinema. You know, she's been around, you know, almost as long as people like, you know, Secret Cinema. You know, you had 20,000 people went to your Dirty Dancing show, you know, Sydney and, and Flemington. I think Danielle's in the audience, you know, uh, you know, a midnight uh, visit. You know, uh, we had the Malt House recently did, you know, Because the Night. We had, um, uh, you know, Bruce uh, Peterson, who's, who's amazing. He's the guy who's behind The Loom in Melbourne. Always good to talk about something in Melbourne when you're in Sydney. Goes down brilliantly. Uh, At least you know, it's not Geelong. Um, so, not Geelong. Yeah. We'll get on to Geelong. Um, but, you know, I, I thought, you know, that, that was great because that was, you know, that was a crisis. You know, don't waste a crisis. You know, the Melbourne Convention Centre was obviously not doing any business during the pandemic. So he said, you know, I'll take a big swathe of it. And, you know, he set up for not actually huge amounts of money, I would say, relative to what we might spend on, on, on other things, you know, in our kind of government budgets. You know, and he's built something which, you know, he didn't give the exact numbers, but I, I know what they are. I won't, I won't say what they are, but, I mean, he's, he's basically competing <laughs> at a level of the NGV, you know. And, you know, six months ago, that didn't exist. And he's competing with the biggest cultural institutions in Australia. Mm. And it's not like a competition. It's not like one or the other. But it shows that audiences want this stuff, mm, I, I would say. The, the, the market, the audiences are definitely there for it. And if in six months he's creating something which is, you know, on a similar number of paying visitors, let's say, uh, to, you know, our, our biggest single cultural institution, the NGV, in terms of visitor numbers, which is one of the biggest 20 in the world or mm, something like mm. that, that tells you that this stuff can happen to quite a Completely. large degree in Australia. And as we know from uh, some of the people I've just talked about in this audience, like the, the talent's out there. But I do think we need to lobby the politicians at local level, at state level, at national level, because this is a real industry. And that's mm -hmm. partly what this, this conversation is about, you know, getting people behind um, that, that industry. I also think we need to educate the private sector because there's a reason why Punch Drunk, uh, sorry, Meow Wolf are getting 158 million from investors in the US and we're not getting that kind of investment over here. Because mm. at the moment, the private sector is kicking a lot of these things off. Mm. By, I mean, individual entrepreneurs like Bruce and, and, and Grande. Um, but actually, I, mean, I think the high street is going to undergo a lot of transformation over the next five to 10 years. You know, you th you, if you, you think about the US and Europe, where things like, it's not a good thing, but you know, Amazon's been around for you know, 20 odd years in those places. And I know in the UK, I mean, I live here now, but you, know, you, you think of brands like Topshop, Debenhams, uh, you know, Topshop was a darling of the high street not that long ago, mm -hmm. doesn't exist now. There's an awful lot of space has become available in the UK, not just on the high street, but also in the, in the US in those big box retail parks that were the future of retail not that long ago. Now, I say it's not a good thing, but Amazon's here. We all know there's been a big shift, shift to e-commerce. We also know and, and that there's been a big shift in terms of, the, of working patterns. You know, I think it's on average people want to spend two days a week in the office in the city. Mm. So, you know, maybe it won't be as extreme as what's happened in the US, but in the US, the reason you've got a lot of Meow Wolf imitators is because it's a good business model, but also there's a hell of a lot of empty retail parks in places mm. like the US now. Mm. So they're becoming experience parks. You know, entrepreneurs are stepping in, whether it's the one end of the spectrum of the trampoline park to the Meow Wolf knockoff at the other <laughs> end. Um, so, but if we can, you know, if we can educate the property developers, if we can educate mm. the investors, but also get some of that seed funding from government for that creative risk taking, yes. yep. then I think we can grow our own, um, you know, industry. And then, as I think as you pointed out, James, we don't need to import a Meow Wolf. We don't need a Secret Cinema or a Punch Drunk. If they want to come here, that's fine. We actually build our own local IP, but you've got to build that talent base and support that talent base to, to get that. Yeah. And you know, you, you mentioned Bruce before. Um, uh, he's been great for 15 years, but nobody yeah. knew. Nobody's an Australian company. Uh, <laughs> it is it, pretty similar to, to to your MO, right? Which is go and 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 
get your credentials overseas and then people back in Australia will talk to you, right? Which is mm. staggering, right? Because, um, you know, he's saying no to so many things now because everybody's like, well, that works, bring it to Canberra. That works, bring it to Cairns. You know, I want to, like, um, and so rather than sort of generating localised, geographically localised uh, 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 projects that are relevant to that, that culture and that space and place, which is you know, something that's fundamental to Australian art, really. Um, we're not doing it as much, but we have a question, sorry. Yeah, hi, Lisa Colley, I'm from the City of Sydney. Um, and look, I, th I just want to go back to Pete's comment around um, Punch Drunk and the, the example of like, we've got a 10 year track record. We've got the numbers, mm. we've got, yeah. And, and the attraction in the property development sector. Sydney is in, has got massive development going on here right now. We've got Tech Central happening, you know, we've got all of the stuff happening around, um, you know, the, um, the harbour front. You know, there's a lot of money being spent. Like, you know, harbour, the harbour side's about to be, you know, pulled down and completely, re, you know, rebuilt. What can we do, and this goes back to your white paper, it's like an industry push to really get the pitch there. Mm to develop something in those spaces that is a unique offer for Sydney. Because, you know, we do need to grow something that is actually unique. We also have, you know, 60,000 years of um, cultural, you know, history here with our Indigenous, you know, mm. peoples. And that is something that is truly, you know, unique. Mm. And so to create something that draws that kind of um, you know, brings that, that story to life, that employs people, that invest in those creatives, but it needs that upfront um, investment and that has to come through the private sector. It's, you know, I mean, I would hope that government too would, you know, be part of that as well um, and there's some pitch that needs to happen there as well, particularly around things like Tech Central where you've got, you know, massive government um, spend there as well. So anyway, it's just a, it's a, it's a, a call to action, I guess, in terms of what you were talking about with mm. the white paper, um, that we we need that pitch, we need that the numbers, we need the data, we need the stories. But a lot of the data is 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 there, right? Um, it, it's channeling it into the, into the mm. right hands. Um, I think there's also, um, I think there is some some. There's some pressure, right, uh, around those types of spaces that are, uh, you know, the, the, unless people know that there's a new model that can be tapped into, then they're not going to do anything with it, right? It's, it's going to be business as usual, right? I think the other thing, and we're going to get into this, is, is the importance of R&D, right? And, and actually, how do you... And, and this was the conversation with Zara, right? <laughs> <laughs> Animal Logic, he describes as a tech company. It's not a creative company, right? So it's actually giving them the, I guess, the tech technician or the technology or the, I don't know how, the technical background, uh, the backbone of the business so that then they can go and make Oscar-winning um, uh, uh, films, right? So I, I think, um, you know, funding that doesn't fund the outcome but actually funds the process. We don't do that. We certainly don't do it in New South Wales. And, and we've talked a lot about this in the, the Nighttime Industries Association is how do you, you talked about bravery before, how do you, how do you encourage bravery? Well, you, you need to mitigate the risk for people, you know, uh, and you need to give them uh, an income so that they can feed their families while they do it, right? Um, if grant funding is for to address a market failure, right? And I don't mean like a, a market that, um, doesn't work otherwise, well, that's kind of what I mean. But <laughs> ultimately, it, it can be there to stimulate a market as well, mm, right? Yeah. And, and so that, that, uh, grants that, I guess, fund process over outcome, you know, how often do you say to a plumber when they come to fix your toilet, tell me the vision for, for the toilet before <laughs> you start. I, I, I want you to describe <laughs> something that you've never done before. <laughs> I want you to write it up in a 300-page procurement document and then I'll give you $5,000. It's mm. ludicrous, right? Like, mm. a lot of the people that are going for this funding, they've proved their chops again and again and again and they have to keep proving it. Why? Why, why do we hold people up to that? Like, I don't know. It's the difference between an EO... And, uh, procurement. Uh, the, there's a difference between an EOI... A request for tender, a <coughs> request for quote, a request for proposal. But it seems that the, the, those that do hold the purse strings often don't know the difference. 
I'm sorry. Like, you know, often when we get, when we get these um, uh, requests that come in, they don't understand the difference between these things. And an EOI is for people that have done something before and that they've got a track record and that they can be trusted. So, so trust them to do the process. You know, trust them to deliver because they've delivered before. Um, anyway. I just wanted to uh, pick up on Lisa's point about, um, you know, sort of First Nations content as well, because I think that's a very obvious example of, mm. of, of where we can, you know, create things that are, that, are, that are different and also things that we can take to other parts of the world. And, and again, what's great is that is starting to happen a little bit. So, you know, we talked about the, the Loom and their latest project with the um, National Museum of Australia is an, uh, an immersive sort of First Peoples um, exhibition. And then at really now at risk of alienating the audience, but um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a board member of Museums Victoria oh. and Mel Melbourne Museum is one of our amazing um, <laughs> institutions. And um, so we, we looked at this space in terms of we could see that trend of, of the rise of immersive. Um, and we've got a, a touring hall, and, and that touring hall, obviously, we bring in exhibitions, uh, ones that we create, ones from other parts of the world. But you know, we also have downtime. So, so we looked at that space and said, well, you know, what if we retrofitted that with um, you know, immersive projection technologies? Um, but we didn't necessarily do a loom and you know, put you know, Van Gogh and sort of stuff like that in. But what if we created sort of local content? So. Um, if you happen to be in Melbourne next month, um, Kayama, which is our first kind of immersive show, is a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of First Nations um, lens on the national, um, on the natural world. But it's very much kind of content created both within the institution, drawing on its collections, drawing on its, um, you know, our own kind of content, and also working with other kind of partners. But that just feels like such an obvious thing for us to be doing mm. in Australia, to tapping into kind of more of that, you know. It's, um, a, you know, Melbourne Museum, we work in Melbourne a lot as well, but the, um, the learning we'll lab... We'll keep the section short. Yeah. The, the learning lab, it was the pilot I don't work in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't dare. You know. um, the, the learning lab, I think there's an image of it up there, yeah. is, I guess, the pilot of that, right? Mm. Because yeah. um, the, it yeah. was a, a dynamic learning space that can change the programming around it. And the thing that I'm most proud about with it is because it's built in such a robust way mm. that other um, immersive artists are being used to it. So uh, used to program it now. And, you know, we haven't picked up the phone, or we haven't been called, um, to, to do more work in that space. But I think that part of that is because we, we create that beacon piece that goes in there, that lighthouse piece, and then others can come in and use that same technology and reprogram it. And it's, you know, mm. it, it, it's giving opportunity for skills development now, um, as much as it is a learning environment for kids to come through. I'm going to keep moving. Excuse me, um, James, you've got a question up here at the back. Sure. Yeah, hi, just on a couple of interesting points, um, my name's Ants from Alive in Melbourne. Um, it's, it's interesting <laughs> when you talk about kind of venues and, and, and repurposing spaces, but on a commercial level, you know, we're looking at developing a, a local concept to tour internationally with a footprint of around 1,500 square metres or so. Mm. To make that commercially viable, it needs to sit in a venue for about 45 days. Mm. Six months of scoping, there's not a venue in this country that could take that exhibition for the next 18 months for a 45-day run and say a five day bump in bump out, including the touring hall. Um, so it, it, it kind of raises the question that whilst on a smaller scale, some of these pop up immersive ideas um, have a great opportunity to tap in with, with property developers, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But when you start looking at larger commercial touring exhibits or locally developed, um, there's certainly a need to start looking at some integration between the venues, um, uh, or, I mean, even, even on a technical level, there actually isn't the stock in this country for, for even 40 projectors to sit for 30 days. Not one single supplier has that stock. So I think there's a bigger issue around, even if you've got the ideas of creativity and the funding, you can't actually get it up operationally. Yeah, well, supply chains are, are bloody woeful at the moment. And I, I think you, you bring up an interesting point. And I've got a whole section here on infrastructure, which I don't think we'll get to. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, but it, yeah. it, is a, it is a really, really good point because the, the, these are anchor attractions, right? So um, to put it in, the, the, I guess, the property parlance, right? Like, ultimately, um, they're honeypots, right? So um, if, if, you, if you 
this is why we need cross-sector conversations, I think. And, you know, uh, th there, is a, there, there is a somewhat of a bubble around people who make the stuff uh, and then uh, people who can fund the stuff and then people who have no idea what it is, right? So I think, um, uh, I think w one, of, one of the things that's happening, I think, um, particularly I know from the advisory group, I is how do we get cross-sector conversations going on? Right? How can we work with councils to understand what spaces might be available? Because, you know, uh, you know, like the Melbourne Museum, can't is not big enough to be able to mm. host something like that. But, you know, there are a lot of big sheds around, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Carriage Works is getting developed at the moment, right? And 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 that has huge spaces. Might not be fit for purpose necessarily. It not, might not have rigging available to be able to get in there and do it right. But. Um, you know, John Hughes, who couldn't be here tonight, who um, is a big advocate of the, the growth in this sector, he's the, uh, the head of Fox Studios. Head of Fox yeah. Studios. Um, he uh, was talking to us about spaces that are, um, uh, lie dormant for 45 days or more mm. um, in between big films, right? So, so he has been... He, I think he's about to leave, actually. I think that's public knowledge now. But he is... Um, he was always trying to find different ways to um, activate those huge spaces, which are right at the centre of the entertainment quarter, in ways that um, you know there might not be that traditional film model that's come through. So, I think it's about communication, it's about collaboration, and about people kind of just just understanding a little bit more around what's on offer, what's available. You know, where's the marketplace for this yeah. kind of stuff? Where can we come together? and talk about these kind of things. You know, the more mature markets have it, right? Like the film market, you fly to Cannes, you sell your film, you know, uh, the buyers are all there. It's all, it's a very mature market. This is still emerging and we need to create those opportunities for people to speak. Remix is one of them, right? Well, yeah, you know, I would, I would just add also, um, you know, potentially what can be a solution to your problem is if, you know, Australian cities are investing in permanent immersive spaces and venues. So I go back to what I was saying around uh, London and immersive everywhere. You know, they've launched London's first permanent immersive venue that can obviously house, you know, these types of shows. Um, that's gone so well, they're launching a second venue, you know, in the space of, you know, you know just, a, just a few years. And then have a look at, like, the States. You've, you've also got, you know, this is that cross-sector thing happening. You've got Area 15, if people have come across that. An Area 15, if you've not come across it, w worth kind of checking out. It's this slightly mad kind of aircraft hangar building in Las Vegas, kind of off, off strip. Um, and it's sort of like an emporium of experiences. So it's the home of um, you know, Mia Wolf's, one of their, their latest um, spaces. They're the kind of anchor tenant. They've got about 60,000 square foot of it. But the rest of the building, it's a really clever idea. A property developer could see you know, <coughs> the, the rise of the experience economy more broadly, not just immersive. So he was looking into kind of hospitality, retail, other areas as well. They're all trying to get in on the immersive, the experience bandwagon. So he said, what have I kind of curated the best providers, you know, around the States and put them in this kind of one building? is this kind of like the shopping mall of the future, mm. but it's a shopping mall of experiences. But that kind of infrastructure, and that's gone gangbusters in the States. It's mm. hugely, hugely popular. That's when people talk around the future of retail and experience in the States, that's the example that everybody keeps coming back to. Now, I think like, you know, does Sid Sydney, yeah, might want to build another theatre, but why aren't we building like permanent mm. immersive mm. venues? You know, mm. whether those are partly commercial, partly um, cultural spaces, then... You've got the flexibility to house these things because you've got purpose-built venues for it. Yeah, well, there's um, the unsolicited proposal that went through government to uh, re-renovate the... Is it the <coughs> Princess Theatre? I don't know if anyone can tell me in the, in the city. The which one? The Not the, the Theatre Royal, yeah. You walk into the Theatre Royal since they've done the renovation... It's exactly the same as it was, right? And 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 the, I don't know. They spent 33 million on that, right? Something like that. And it was it came from an unsolicited proposal into government. And you look at it and you kind of go, "What are they building for? They're building for 30, 40 years ago. They're not building for what the future might hold." But then you look at Playbill and what they've done with the Horton Pavilion. That is staggering, right? Like that is a that's a transformer of a space, right? Like you literally. I don't know if it's that good, but you click a button and the whole thing, you know, or at least that's what it looks like in the uh, video. I was blown away by it. I was like, <laughs> this is really cool, right? Because you can, you, you know, multi-use 
you know, architects have been screaming about this for years, you know, you, it, whether it comes down to the material or the hardware. Anyway, I'm talking a lot. I want to ask Dorothy a question. Yeah, the, when, you, when, you, when you're ready, when you've asked Dorothy, you've got another question back here. Yeah, easy. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, uh, I want to talk about skills shortage, right, um, because um, skills shortage is something that's affecting every industry at the moment. But how do we, how do we nurture talent in Australia in this space? What, what do we need to do? Or Pete, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Dorothy, but, uh, the, you know... No, if, if no, no. Yeah. I mean, I guess, you know, part of what I do and, and part of what I'm passionate about is creating artist ecosystems, right? So it's around how do we um, how do we bring together an existing artist that's high profile with an up-and-coming artist and how do they work together so that there's this, you know, sharing of knowledge. Um, we, I mean, we have the talent, right? <laughs> so so um, if I think about... Um, if I think about my company, so there's only three of us, right? So we're very small, okay? So, <laughs> um, and, and all we do is curate and we're creative strategists, right? Then we call upon this insanely talented group of individuals from Sydney um, who are literally the best in the world at what they do. So I don't know if... D Darren, are you here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> So, I mean, Darren Genius Brown... Genius in the corner yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he's worked on every major event in the world from a um, production point of view. Um, Dan Potra, from a theatre point of view, has worked on Olympics, you know, um, Cirque du Soleil. Like, these people are in Sydney. Mm -hmm. Like, we've, we've got them here. It's, it's around connecting them, right? And, 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 um, and working together on these projects. And we, we talked earlier that there's... It's not a... Not a supply problem necessarily, no. and it's not a demand problem. The problem is the bit in the middle, right? It's actually Completely. getting the getting the jump back and forth, right? There's skills and talent, and there's opportunity, but sort of, I guess, what is blocking it? What is that hurdle? Do you think? Andy's on the cash down I think here. Yeah. There's an opportunity to join the dots better between. I mean, obviously, with Remix, we try and create a forum to bring different mm. industries yep. together, and but I think you, you know. How, how many times have we read over the last couple of years how different parts of Australia are investing heavily in the film industry, which is great, you know, you know, new sound studios and all these production facilities as everyone's trying to cash in on obviously the, the boom in, um, you know, sort of film production in Australia, that, that makes sense. But also you go, well, these are very complementary skills to growing an immersive industry. And, and, and it was interesting, like, like John, you talked about from Fox Studios, was talking about we're in this really interesting phase because of the pandemic where a lot of that Australian talent that was working out of Hollywood and you know, other parts of the world, you know, they've been over here now. And is our local film industry alone, no matter how many new studios we build, going to sustain and grow that talent base? Well, it will to an extent. But if you really sort of said, well, actually, related industries, games, immersive, and we talked to the, about the fact that they're all converging anyway, immersive is another reason for that talent to stay here because you're talking about, you know, set building or you're talking around things like, you know, virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality, all of these, these things that actually, if you start bringing these industries together, and again, I think it maybe comes about that conversation around government and educating them that actually there's kind of multiple industries here. And James, you had all those amazing statistics around why the immersive industry is sort of so mm. important. So is that a bigger opportunity over the next five, 10 years, or at least as big as something like the film industry? Or as we've said, you could argue they're kind of all the same industry anyway and from a talent base. So, so it, feel, it feels to me like there is definitely a job of, of educating the politicians as to the possibilities and the opportunities there, you know. So it's a good segue for me. Who wants to talk about tax rebates, right? Oh, <laughs> yes, please. This, is, this really excites me, right? Because I, I come from a film background. I me mentioned it before, right? Like, I'm serious. Like, no, 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 so, you are. <laughs> yeah, I told you about it. Um, so there's this... Uh, uh, Film, the film industry is, is built in Australia around a thing called Quape. Does anyone know what Quape is? Does people, have people used it before? So Quape is qualifying Australian production expenditure. Unless you're a producer, you generally don't really want anything to do with it or to know anything about it. But what it is really good for is um, uh, subsidising the delivery of a film project, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's 40%, uh, a 40% tax rebate applies to... Uh, uh, films that are generating that, that are culturally relevant. I think it can almost go up to 50%. So 30% comes from the feds, 10% uh, comes from your local, state or territory, and then there's an additional 10%. So that's 50% of your total production expenditure. 
Do you know who's getting it at the moment? Mostly Hollywood, right? Who are sending their films over because they get that uh, it's an incentive to shoot your films and produce and deliver your films in Australia, right? So one of the things that blows me away around Quape um, um, is that it only applies to films. Until recently, mm -hmm. they moved it across into gaming, right? So we've got this mechanic. It's a rebate. It works. What we need the government to do is to say, well, that actually applies to more cultural uh, uh, enterprise, creative enterprise, than simply... Because just because you're a writer and you're writing a novel, and I know this is a really... Um, I'm taking two very different... But if I get, a, if I get a, an advance on a book up to the tune of $50,000, which... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, most, of, most, <laughs> most of our writers are actually living below the poverty line, which is disgusting. But 50, say I get $50,000. In this fictional world. Yeah. In this fictional yeah, world. Fictional this world. Is a, a hypothetical here. <laughs> but 40, you know, if, if I can get another $40,000 that I can borrow against, which is essentially a government guaranteed bond, for the delivery of that project, and you know that as a writer I've delivered you know, 10 books. I'm not Leanne Moriarty, but I am. I can write a book and I can deliver it to market. That's what, they're, that, that's what they're counting on. And what that does is it generates creative activity. And what we need them to do is to, re, to apply that mechanic, which we know works, to different industries, including the immersive industry, right? Because it's hard to get these projects up. We need... Um, if you have to go for a grant, then, like I said, with the plumber, you have to position your work as being... And anyway, I, I think it's something that is going to be a core part of what we put towards the state government initially and to the, towards the federal government. Um, how else are projects getting funded? We did talk a little bit about that. Um, oh, sorry, we had a question up yeah, the back. I think we yeah, had a question, yeah. And we've got another one down here. <laughs> Bit off topic, but... Um uh, Ash Nicholson, I'm from CBRE, so we're not a property developer, but we represent space in every asset class across the nation, and we'd love to talk about how we can use vacant space and bring some kind of immersive experience into our leasing strategy so that there's a real nice win-win. So if you want space, we'd love to start <laughs> the conversation. Amazing, let's That's do a it. a fantastic contribution to the evening. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's ears pricked up. Um, Andy, did you have a question? Hi, um, Andy Hoyne. I, look, I, for all the good intentions of government, my view is we can't rely on them for anything. Um, and it's such a slow-moving beast that the, the sort of expectation we would have from their contribution is so many years away, don't hold your breath. Everything has to come from private enterprise. Um, to the previous comment from CBRE, we have enormous amounts of unutilised space. Interestingly, mostly owned by government. Like there's, you know, if you just look at Sydney alone, the Sydney Harbour Trust, massive, mm. massive amounts of unused space sitting all over central Sydney, absolutely accessible, doing nothing with it, just sitting there, sitting there for decades. Mm. Now, that's a good starting point. That's pretty much all we need from government. Just give us the space and walk away. But in terms of the funding mechanism, it has to be a business case about being profit driven. Um, from an investment point of view, whether you are engaging with developers, investors, landlords. And the problem that I see in this country is the people who hold the purse strings have no idea this sector even exists. Mm. They're going, oh my God, our retail centres are quiet. We'll get more restaurants. Mm. Let's do something experiential, a cinema, mm. right? Oh no, let's do something crazy new, a bowling alley. They don't know. Mm. They don't know. If you look at all the biggest kind of uh, developers in the category of retail, whether they're Westfield, AMP, Charter Hall, doesn't matter. They have no idea. Mm. They need to be shown the business case of what we're seeing on screen, these incredible global organisations. And I've been to many of these around the world. And they're off the chart. You will wait two or three hours just to get in the door. Yeah, yeah, the line yeah. is that long. Yeah. You can't fathom the amount of revenue they're creating on a daily basis. So the business case exists to the point that you can go to a tiny town and have the line down and around the corner. You don't need necessarily to be in Sydney or Melbourne to make a profitable venture because these things are so incredible in what they offer mm. a broad public experience. Mm. Mm. So my view is that, you know, you kind of, kind of look at this from the, from the point of view of engaging government for space, looking for investors, talking to either landlords or, or developers, 
and, and figuring out how this can be the epicentre that creates the halo effect that enables them to rent retail for more money, to mm -hmm. sell apartments for more money, mm -hmm. to rent, you know, commercial office for more money. This is the magnet that can actually drive value in every other asset class because it's never going to pay the same amount of rate per square metre. Mm. But it doesn't need to if it drives value. In the same way the live music industry has been doing all through America. That sector was dead. <coughs> but the live music industry in America has come back to life because it is the magnet that drives value in every other asset class. Mm. Mm. We're really lucky to have Andy in the room for that <coughs> comment because it, you know, if you haven't seen his books, please have a look at those books because they are Bibles um, in terms of how to understand value and, and creating value for communities, right? Like, uh, it, it's, yeah, beautiful, wonderful book and brain over there um, if you want to chat to him afterwards. Sorry, I'm selling you here. Um, but um, that uh, you, you mentioned government, right? So uh, government... Uh, particularly cultural institutions, and I know there's representation in the room from many cultural institutions here tonight because this is a key interest area, and, but it often falls to them um, to, to develop up these, and, and they're restricted on OPEX. They don't have the CAPEX to be able to do it, but one of the things that I think is challenging, um, and, and this is a key area that the Creative Industries Advisory Group's looking into, is, um, sorry, the subcommittee, is this top-down approach to procurement, right? The, the, the government or the, the organisation, the cultural organisation, they had come up with an idea and then they put it out to market, right? But there has to be some kind of facility. So take the sub base um, over in um, uh, um, uh, Neutral Bay, for example. How can you put an idea forward? There's, there's no channel in government to put up a, 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 a use case or a business case even if it's for profit or if it's not for profit, there's no way of actually getting that up into, into government. It's all top down. So I, th I think that's one of the things that we really need to change. We need to, like, um, I hate to say it, but Victoria does it a lot better. You've had uh, a lot of, uh, uh, done a lot of work with the creative state down there. Yeah, I was going to say, I actually think cultural institutions are a key part of this. Yeah. It's big. So, so we've done a project. Um, with State Library Victoria over the last couple of the years called Alchemy. Um, and State Library Victoria is kind of really interesting because um, this is sort of pre-pandemic, but they pre-pandemic, because, because it was, um, you know, previously the NGV, the museum was in there. It's quite a big kind of public space. It's free. It's in the second busiest part of Melbourne. So it had over 2 million visitors a year, which makes it pretty much the most visited library in the world. Which is a bit mad. We think it's got more visitors in the Library of Congress than the British Library. We're pretty sure more than the New York Library, but they publish it as a big group of all the New York libraries. So, I looked at that and, and, and thinking about developing an experience strategy, which we did for a you know a, a big cultural institution. I looked at. It, I said, well, you've got two million people. You've got these incredible public spaces that have just been approved by a you know 88 million redevelopment project. What have we invited those experienced designers from the creative community? into the library to come up with things that will attract new audiences that we might not be the right people as a library to, to deliver um, and will engage our new audiences in different ways. So, so we developed this idea, Alchemy, and it was very much an expression of interest. It was. And we managed to get a bit of money out of um, the state government and we said, we want 10 experienced designers. You can be a creative tech company, you can be a visual artist, doesn't matter. You don't have to be from the creative sector. We just want you to develop creative experiences for the library. And we're going to give you 20 grand each. And we don't want you to do anything for that 20 grand in terms of delivery experience. What we want is to work up the business case. We want you to develop, of course, an amazing creative experience. But we're going to give you, and I spent three months with each of these teams incubating these ideas to get them to the point of being able to put a pitch to the library about a new type of creative experience that hadn't happened in the library previously. And we had nearly 400 applications. So, you know, it kind of blew me away in just the quality of, of talent that came forward. But to give you an idea, to cut a long story short, the sort of things that have come out of it are, you know, we had one of Australia's leading escape room designers applied. Um, and up until this point, he runs two escape rooms very profitably in Melbourne. But, you know, um, you know they're, they're based around movies and things like that. So they're very commercial escape room models, you know, within that immersive sector. So he thought, well, if I work with the library, this is an opportunity to try something really different. So what he proposed was a 
educational collection story-based um, escape room, which would unlock a hidden part of the library, some catacombs that exist underneath the library, oh, nice. that commercially just wouldn't be viable to open up. And there's all kinds of issues. But actually, you can run an escape room model quite profitably on relatively small numbers of people. And it was like, join the dots between those two different worlds. And it turns out, escape room designers, some of Australia's like leading TikTok stars, People like James who applied, you know, actually really want to work with our cultural institutions to help them develop new experiences, but to kind of co-create things that perhaps neither one of them would do alone. So I, I, that feels to me like if, if we can get our cultural sector to be really generous around opening up their spaces, their resources, to what we know has got the potential to be a massive industry, that, that could be a huge step in the right direction. But I also think what you said, Lisa, about property development, it's not, you're right, it's not just going to be about our cultural institutions, the public sector. You know, we make our property developers, we make them do the kind of public art tax, don't we? We say, if you're going to build a new development, put some public art on, can't we get a bit smarter about how we use that money and say, well, why don't you invest in sustainable Australian creative businesses in the immersive space? <laughs> But going back to the, the, the top of the room, that can't just be the kind of stick model, like you've got to do it. You also need the carrot. You've got to be saying, well, you know, did you know in, the, in Vegas they've got Area 15, and actually they've, they've got Meow Wolf almost, and I mean, they make pots of money, but they would have them as a loss leader, frankly, because Meow Wolf bring in the people and the buzz that will make mm. all the other businesses an Area 15 kind of fire. So it's kind of, it is all of these things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and uh, so the alchemy, just yeah. the... the Talk about your project, James. You well, have no, you know. we, we had a, we've got a project called Spellbound that we put forward. And I, I spoke to um, our, the lead down there the other day and um, they're still trying to get their heads around it, right? Because it's caused, it's, it, what we put forward was so far beyond what I think they were expecting that they can't, they can't actually get their system, system around it they can't they can't understand well i'm not sure even if we can do that and she just said you've thrown a huge cat amongst the pigeons we really need, need uh, can you give us another eight weeks to respond to this because we can't get the team to get their head around how we might even approach this you know that's a win from my perspective even if the project doesn't get up we're actually challenging the model of the library and how they work right and 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 we own the library well, we don't own that one because we're in, a, in New South Wales. But, but <laughs> the people own these institutions. They're ours, yeah. right? And uh, Corinne, who's got a, a question in the moment, but I saw something at your conference. Um, uh, I don't know where he was from, maybe s uh, north of uh, uh, Spain. Um, the, uh, do you remember what the name of the... Fundación Telefónica. Yeah, so th this museum, a museum, art gallery, maybe? Yes. Mm. Um, which is a, a gallery that celebrates local art, uh, uh, cr uh, craft, right, and, and uh, uh, local produce and local um, art and culture. It's everybody's, right? So if you want to go in and do a, um, uh, a tango lesson on a Thursday night, you can book it out, right? Imagine doing that at the Art Gallery in New South Wales. I'm going to run a PT session um, uh, downstairs in the gallery. Like, they're ours, right? They, they need, we need to bring down the walls and say, well, we want to try something new with it, right? Like, it doesn't always have to be commercially motivated, but, like, um, you know, there's examples of that happening around the world at the James, moment. you're missing a plug here. So, so, so I'm collaborating with James on the next version of Alchemy, which is going to be with another major Melbourne institution, but... It is. We are definitely open to doing something very similar in Sydney. So there's any cultural institutions out there and you Absolutely. want one of these, you know? Yes. Talk to us. Yes, 100%. I didn't know what you were going to plug then. I was like... <laughs> a few things going on. <laughs> um, Corinne, you had a question. Yes. And so, uh, apologies, everybody. I think Tom's given me time. We're out. Um, so <laughs> yeah, right. if you can question. give us a question. Yes, Corinne from Communicate in the Arts. Fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, one question. What about sustainability? How does this uh, industry uh, address the topic of being sustainable? And uh, how do they answer the question of the climate change? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think it's these, a these industries are heavily reliant on a lot of AV equipment. Mm. <laughs> so it is a great question and it's something that definitely needs to be addressed and there are some key players that are looking at that, but at the moment it, it's, it's not sustainable. Mm. But technology is not the only way to create an immersive experience. That's exactly right. So there are a whole bunch of different ways that you can... You know, somebody wrote a brilliant question. I'm going to call you out here. Um... <laughs> 
Our busy cities to most people are their backdrops in life. Apart from uh, immersive installations, how can we broaden the usage into our day-to-day -day lives? Example, create immersive environment within the city to drown out the noise and hustle and the bustle. What could that look like? Well, I, it doesn't look like technology to me, right? Like, as soon as I read that question, I go, well, you know, there, there are a number of different ways of doing that. And I think that there, you know... I've got a great example, actually. Yeah, okay, yeah. So there's an incredible um, Danish artist called Dan Rosegaard, and uh, one of the pieces that we want to do for Noriad next year is the idea of turning all the lights off, like starting the festival by turning the lights off, bringing everyone out so they can look up at the stars before it all starts. So that's an immersive experience. And there's an emotional connection with that as well. And particularly because Riyadh is the third largest light polluter in the world. <laughs> so there's real relevance around doing it there. Mm. Mm. You know what they should do? Do a light festival. Yeah, yeah. they should yeah. do that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, look, uh, you know, if you could say anything to this wonderful group of people that have uh, given us their Thursday night, Wednesday night. What day is it? I'm losing track. Um, uh, what would you say? Just to, I guess, uh, you've got evangelists in the room. What, what would you like to say to them? Okay. Um, so, I guess what I'm seeing is there's, you know, so much happening internationally, right? And and I feel like we have all the skills here. We can do. We we can create magic. Like we really can. Um, you know, if we look at, um, like, you know, okay, Saudi Arabia and all the money, that's fine. But even Europe, you know, like, there's, there's, just, there's just so much happening. Um, and and uh, I, we just need to be, I, I, know, I don't want to say brave again, but what we need to do is lead, right? We need to go, okay, let's not, let's not borrow. Let's, you know, let's bring in some experts and, and, and create something that's bespoke to Australia. And if we have to bring in international artists to work with those people as well, like, you know, we're not saying don't do that, but, you know, let's, let's bring those people in and, and let's make it happen. Pete? Uh, I just think actually this is part of the solution. I, I, for me, it was so heartening to read the guest list to find that we've got people from property, artists, government, cultural institutions, like, I mean, for me, it's why I do things like Remix, is to bring the groups together. And, and like you said, you do what you do with three people. You know, <laughs> I think this is where, you know, where the startup sector is really good, is you find those kind of, you know, you'd hope in a room tonight there'll be ideas, but you bring together that group of co-founders that have got different skills. You work out where you don't have the skills, and you find that the people that will you know, make the sort of the dream happen, and, mm. and it's about putting teams together. And often those teams are most effective when they are kind of cross-disciplinary. They come from kind of slightly different worlds, and, and that's where you spot problems to solve and come up with, with new ideas. So, so I just think it's great that we're doing this, and hopefully it's the start of a, a journey in terms of lobbying to, to grow this industry. Yeah, it's a big job, but I think we've got to do it together, right? And if you can just go and tell, like Andy said, nobody knows about the industry, right? Like, just go out and evangelise, talk to people about it. I was at a 40th the other night, talking to a, a really old mate of mine, and I had my phone out, and I was just, like, searching stuff. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? And, like, he's going away James going... great fun at a party. Yeah, I know, I'm really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Watch me, you search the internet. Um, <laughs> um, but just go out and evangelise. Talk to people. You know, try and get projects up and just find ways of, of, of supporting one another. Because, it, you know, when it, we, we can't do it as individuals. We have to do it as a group, and we need to put pressure on Pete, the right people. Um, to get these projects up, and, and thank you. Uh, sorry, one last question. I was just going to... Um, so, for somebody, you've talked about how you can... Excuse me, sorry, do you want to take that? Then we can... <laughs> then we'll all can you just give us your name and... and yeah. I'm Muskan, and I'm studying creative industries. It's my... I've just started, like, it's the first semester. <laughs> but how my Adorable. professors are promoting creative industries are they're actually making us write grant applications about come up with an idea that could be a part of immersive experience and be in Sydney. So I think that's a great way to do that. But as a student, how can we contribute to that? That's just part of the syllabus, right? Walk around today. <laughs> you haven't got a better room. Uh, for this subject matter. You know, everybody here has either been doing it for some time or wants to be doing it mm. or has some skills that can transfer or has some space, like CBREU. <laughs> you know, just walk around and see if you can help, right? Like, uh, 
I'm a great believer that if you start in an industry, you start at the bottom and you work your way up, and that's how you learn from experience, right? Uh, two people across from you, you've got somebody who worked from the ground up, right, mm. and, and, and has, has, has done it her way the whole way through, right? Uh, talk to Tam, you know. There are people that are doing really interesting stuff, so you just got to find ways to, to get on the ticket and earn, earn, earn your stripes, so. Um, so but Yes. Yeah. Sorry, mate. Yeah. We could talk about this. I could talk about this for, for, for a long time. But thank you, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. The bar is open. Please continue the conversation. And thank you. Sorry. Thank you to Dorothy and thank you to Pete. And to James. And Zara, who couldn't be here, but we'll be here. Thank you very much.